All right, um, good evening everyone. Today I'm going to be presenting about a study that I've conducted as part of my PhD thesis in health psychology. So this is a study where we looked at using an active visualization device to try and improve adherence to antiretroviral therapy within South Africa. Before I move on to talk about the study that we conducted, I thought I'd give a bit of background about my PhD topic. So my thesis is looking at this idea of visualization and how we can use visualizations of medical disease and treatment to improve adherence. So the idea here is that we show patients what's going on inside their body, both in terms of how their illness might have occurred, but also how treatment might help to try and control that. So we do that through using a number of things, such as 3D modeling or animations, images, that can show patients these processes that are occurring inside. More recently, we've been interested in this uh, concept called active visualization. So the distinction here is that instead of using these static kind of images or 3D models, we instead use animations or even live demonstrations. And the idea here is that these things can actually show more of a process of what's going on inside the body instead of just a still snapshot of uh, one point in time. So we use one of these active visualizations within the study that I'm going to talk about today. And this is the device uh, in certain stages as we were going through development. What it ended up looking like was this picture here. So it's basically a human-shaped body made of perspex. And what we wanted to do was to really clearly demonstrate what happens when patients take their antiretroviral therapy versus when they don't. And unlike other treatments with antiretroviral therapy, if patients don't adhere, the treatment actually becomes less effective over time. So we have this liquid inside, which is pink, and we say that that represents the presence of the virus within the body. And we change the color of the liquid inside from pink to clear. We do that through changing the pH balance of the liquid inside. So we add in a tablet that represents their medicine, but it's actually just an aspirin tablet. So the body always starts pink, and we explain that this represents the presence of your HIV infection. However, when you take your tablet each day, this fizzes around, and the liquid inside eventually turns clear. This represents that the HIV viral load is under control, and it's not able to replicate. So that's what occurs on day one, but we wanted to explain the purpose of consistent adherence over time. So even though on day one, your viral load is under control because you've taken your medicine, on day two, you then need to take it again. So we add in some more of this virus solution, which changes the color inside back to pink, and then again, we add another tablet that fizzes around and changes it back to clear. So helping patients to understand that the infection isn't reversible, but by taking their medicine each day, they can control the level of viral load inside their body. We then show patients what happens if they are consistently not adherent over time. So they keep missing doses over and over again, and we just have our virus solution going into the body. The color inside becomes more and more and more pink. And this time when uh, the person forgets, uh, sorry, remembers to take their medicine, it's dropped into the body and it fizzes around, but the color remains pink. So helping patients to understand that if they consistently miss doses, uh, their treatment's actually gonna become ineffective at controlling the level of virus within their body. That was a pretty quick run through of uh, the methodology we used, but we have published this editorial which does explain it in a bit more detail um, in AIDS and behavior. So moving on to the randomized controlled trial, this was a study that we conducted, um, as I mentioned, in South Africa, and we wanted to use this device to see if we could improve adherence within a group of non-adherent patients. And our primary outcome measure here was change in viral load, um, which we measured from looking at patients' blood tests. So if viral load should decrease as patients are more adherent to their treatment, that's kind of the direct association between those two things. Just a bit about the context. So we conducted this study in collaboration with Stellenbosch University. That's about 30 minutes outside of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, and you can see here the kinds of clinics that we were working in are quite different to what we might see when we're working um, within clinics here in New Zealand. And of course, South Africa has a very uh, large HIV epidemic and the number one reason for treatment failure is actually non-adherence to treatment. The study itself, we ended up uh, recruiting 111 HIV patients. So these were patients who were failing on their regimen one or two treatment. Uh, they were recruited from two sites, a peri-urban hospital and a community clinic. They completed a baseline assessment and then were randomized into one of two conditions, the control and intervention group. I just thought I'd point out that in this context, standard care, which was received by all 
uh, participants includes adherence counselling. So that's the doctor actually talking to the patient about their non-adherence, explaining the problems with it, and trying to encourage them to change their behaviour. So all patients receive that, um, but our intervention patients also saw our active visualisation device, and we collected follow-up data anywhere from two months after they saw the intervention, and then retrospectively went back and got a baseline level of viral load from their blood test data as well. Um, just a bit about the sample, I think it's important to point out the differences between our sample and what we might see if we're working within chronic illness here in New Zealand. Um, and that's really a quite low level of education, a high rate of unemployment, and low levels of monthly family income. So it's a really low socioeconomic status group, and I think that's something to remember um, when thinking about working within this context. So moving on to the results, this was our primary outcome, change in viral load over time from baseline to follow-up. And this is the raw level of uh, viral load within their blood test. So you can see here that the intervention condition decreases significantly more than the control group over time. You can see, however, that these numbers are really large when you look at what viral load is and how it's calculated. So more commonly, we report the log transformed score, which is an expression of these numbers to the power of 10. You can see here again that the intervention condition significantly, um, sorry, marginally significantly improved at 0.06 uh, versus the control group, and that's actually a clinically significant reduction. So any change of 0.5 or more in log viral load is associated with a 30% decrease in the risk of clinical progression. And I think it's important again to remember that we'd expect everyone to get better because everyone had adherence counselling, but it's great that our brief intervention was able to improve it to a clinically significant amount uh, even above that. And just a bit of psychological data that we collect, we always ask our participants, what thoughts ran through your mind when you saw the device? Obviously these things are quite abstract, so it's interesting to see the ideas that people take away. And we coded these thoughts and found that uh, more than half of the sample actually had a thought relating to adherence, which was really good. They were taking away the message that we wanted them to. So thoughts such as my adherence beforehand was poor, um, I now see how important the treatment is, so that was really encouraging to see. What can we conclude from this study? Well, our device was highly accepted and it seems to highlight the importance of adherence to our group of participants. Our device was brief, portable, and it's very easy to use. And it, it resulted in a clinically significant change in viral load for this really high need group of uh, non-adherent patients within this context of South Africa. There are, of course, some limitations to what we found. The first would be the viral load data that we had available. Um, this was quite messy. We just looked at the records that patients had from naturally coming in and, and having their routine blood test appointments. Um, of course, that meant there was a lot of missing data and a lot of variability in when they actually showed up for testing. But we figured that was better and less influential than asking them to come in and have another blood test, which could also be interfering with their behaviour change that we want to see. Um, there may have been other contextual factors going on that affected patients' adherence to appointments um, and adherence to their medicine as well. And there may have been language barriers as our session was only conducted in Afrikaans and English. I think there are significant strengths of our study though, and one would be that ecological validity. So we went into this context and uh, we delivered this session alongside the patients speaking to their doctor. So it could easily be incorporated into standard care as a sort of adjunct to this adherence counselling. Where do we go from here? Well, I think there's a lot of applications for this device. Um, it could be used at treatment initiation, so helping patients to understand the need for treatment in the first place so they don't become non-adherent. Um, it could be used with children. It's a nice, easy educational tool to understand this quite difficult and abstract process. With pregnant women, so they understand the need to be adherent to their treatment and they don't pass on infection to their unborn child. And obviously it could be used within remote communities, which is really important within South Africa. Um, it doesn't rely upon technology. It's very cheap, which means it could be taken to these hard-to-reach communities. And there is also some application uh, to use this device within PrEP, so to help patients to understand the purpose of pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, which helps to prevent HIV infection from being contracted. So that's all from me, just some acknowledgements to my supervisors, um, our collaborators at Stellenbosch University, and some other people who were, individual, uh, who were in instrumental sorry, in helping us create this device. Thank you.